Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Stacy Lampkin. She is a pediatric pharmacist and an aroma therapist, patient advocate, turned patient advocate after being diagnosed with breast cancer at 33. Thankfully, in June 2021, she has been cancer free for three years. Stacy has joined me today to talk about how we can become better health care advocates for ourselves and our loved ones. So thanks for joining me, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. Well, I think it's super important. And as we were speaking offline before I hit record, I kind of struggle a little bit with being an advocate because I don't want to be a problem child. And I know that rattling cages and getting all upset and angry doesn't generally help. But before we dive into all that stuff, why don't you tell us about yourself and your background and how all of this stuff came to be? Yeah, so my background is, as you mentioned, pediatric pharmacy. So I've been doing that for about 10 years, and I'm in a pediatrician's office, actually, where I do my clinical work. So often people think pharmacists, they think of dispensing medications, but I work right hand in hand with a lot of providers on a daily basis. And then, as you mentioned in the introduction, at 33, I got cancer. That was a whirlwind of a time. And while I always knew our healthcare system had lots of barriers to it, that really brought to light all the barriers that a patient faces. And I started recognizing that we might need more education around how to be better advocates on both ends, not just patients knowing how to advocate for themselves, but providers letting, helping support patients advocating for themselves. But so since then, as I went through that whole journey, I realized that I love education and I really want to help people navigate the healthcare system and have just open up conversations on how to be better advocates for themselves. And then I still have that pediatric passion. So I do usually focus on pediatrics and how to advocate for kids, but it all applies realistically. The concepts are the same, regardless of who? Well, especially when one is taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's and they get to a stage where they can't make decisions or they can't participate in decisions. It's very similar to children. And I don't say that is a derogatory thing. It's just a fact. You know, it's like when they don't remember their last name or, the, or their relationship to you, obviously difficult decisions aren't going to be easy or possible. We just, my, my frustration with my mom's doctors towards the end of her life was more along the lines of they couldn't cure her or fix her. So there was a lot of times I felt like I got the impression that they were like, we can't fix her or cure her. Why are you here? So that was frustrating. And I don't know if there was something I should have done differently. Just transporting her to the doctor was a giant headache. I, I, I just I felt like the monkey in the middle of this crazy whatever between her doctors and their seemingly lack of understanding of my situation and Alzheimer's in general. And my mom, who obviously couldn't understand what was going on and why she needed to go see the doctor because the care home thought she had a UTI. I was just like, Ugh. just it got to be a challenge that I really did not like doing. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it be a challenge, obviously taking care of somebody and then the extra stress of feeling lost when say, people saying, I can't help you. And I do always just like to mention it's frustra- it's super frustrating and it's not right. But at the same time, healthcare providers and most providers, pharmacists are taught to fix people and help people. And our society is not great at having the quality of life conversations. We're so focused on the quantity of life conversations. And what I found is as a, like, we have to start having those conversations and say, like, I think some of it is there's this innate fear that if we start talking about death or bad outcomes that people like, run away and hide, right? But sometimes we have to have those conversations of what are your goals? What is manageable Mm -hmm. for both? Yeah, what do you want? I have actually been a huge advocate for that. And last summer, my husband and I are like, oh, 
we have got to do our trust you know, our estate planning. We are in our mid fifties now, like, come on people, get your put stuff together. And it was comforting on one hand that the lawyer said, oh no, you guys are actually a kind of ahead of the curve. I'm like, well, that's nice that we're not like bad children, but that's not saying very much because, you know, I'll be 55 this November. My husband will be 57 in October. So it's not like we're spring chickens. My paternal grandmother lived just past her 103rd birthday. My maternal grandmother lived to 91 with vascular dementia and possibly also Alzheimer's. She's never diagnosed, but that's my armchair diagnosis for you. <laughs> take for take that for what it's worth. Not much. So, you know, unless I get hit by a bus riding my bike, God forbid, you know, I, I expect to live to be, you know, I feel like I got another 40, 45 years, which is a really long time. There are days that sounds exhausting. <laughs> but, you know, the the only time the estate planning and the end of life conversations got challenging was when the attorney said, OK, you want all of your, you know, your estate and your assets to go to your daughter. Logical. We only have one child. What happens if she dies first? And I remember looking at him going excuse me? That's a terrible question. And he laughed and I'm like, Ugh, I have to think about that. And he goes, yeah, but you don't have to answer it right now. And she is engaged. The wedding is actually being planned finally. Yay. Thanks Yay. for COVID screwing that all up. And, you know, he's one of five. He's the youngest of five and they grew up quite poor. And, you know, at first there's like this almost not such a nice thought process of, well, if she goes first and we give him all of our stuff, you know, then you start thinking of all this negative nonsense that, you know, we just shouldn't even think about when we're talking about people that we care about. I think that the attorney came back one with some of the documents we had to sign. And he's like, so have you decided what happens in this scenario? And I'm like, we'll be dead. We won't care. Just give it all to him. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, really, it wasn't that big a decision. Like, He's been in our family for nine years, almost. By the time this comes out, it'll be nine years. You know, they are getting married. I'm like, do I care? No. You know, like if he's going to go gamble it away, not prob not likely. You know, does he help his parents? Okay, that wouldn't hurt my feelings. Like, I'm not going to care. I'll be gone. Fine. Mm -hmm. Decision done. That was the hardest part of that conversation. And once you just sort of get past all of the overthinking and negative thoughts on other people's decisions or possible decisions it's really not that big a deal so i've been sharing that story a lot because we talked about it i'm still kicking so <laughs> fairly yeah i think it's important to talk about and then even with healthcare and and kids we should be having these conversations like do you have decisions right as if like, something happens to me or something happens um to anybody like do you have a decision plan in place to advocate for that person? Do they know your wishes? Do they know your plans? And some of that actually has to go through lawyers, depending on the phase of the, how their age, right? So an adult, when we're talking about caregivers, I think people don't realize the difference between a healthcare proxy, who like who's a HIPAA share of information and in an emergency contact. And I think when we're dealing with people with dementia or might not be able to answer for themselves and make decisions, like is all of that in place? Yes, thankfully we've done that because obviously having gone through what I've been through for 20 years with my mom and my grandmother and my great grandmother, although she died before I was born, so I didn't quote deal with that. I just heard stories. The whole Alzheimer's conversation came up and I do have a past episode on an Alzheimer's living will that is even more detailed. And if you want to look at it in a negative way, you know, it's it talks about things like, you know, feeding tubes and you know it it basically helps ensure if you cannot make decisions for yourself that you have laid out what your quality of life expectations are in context of having alzheimer's or some other neurodegenerative disease oh i said that right this morning <laughs> it's early <sighs> it's crazy but yeah it's you know it's a lot to think about but once you do it it's like oh done you know it's like i've checked that off I'm sure the attorney will come back at some time and say, probably time to check in and make sure this is an up updated and we're all in the same Rotary Club together. So that shouldn't be too hard. You know, it's one of those things, put a reminder in your phone for five years from now, update trust document. 
happens. Yeah, that's great. And my I was assigned power of attorney for my mom's health care in my parents' trust. So that was a blessing because I know lots of people don't have that and it's a nightmare. So that's going to take us, now that we've digressed a little bit, it's going to take us back into healthcare advocacy. First off, get your estate documents situated. Help your parents get them situated. Even though it's it's not a fun conversation, but once you do it, it's over. It's not like you have to keep having this conversation a hundred times. You know, you just, I think I would explain to my parents if they were both still around and under different circumstances, obviously. Knowing what I know now, I would tell them, look, I want to make sure that I'm doing what you want. I want to make sure that your quality of life is what is best we can make it. And so I have been informed that these are the things I need to do. So let's get them done. Easier said than done. Some people don't cooperate. It's a challenge. So hopefully you don't have to go to court to get those rights granted to you to be a healthcare advocate for your family members. But if you do, well, there's people out there that can help with that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm not a lawyer, but I think it's, yeah, yeah I'm glad we mentioned it because I think that's important that people don't realize that as a caregiver, you ha- there's legal, to be a decision maker, there's legal pa- processes and paperwork to go through. Now, if you want to talk about health care and help advocate and help the person make a decision, but they ultimately are the one making a decision, there's still actually paperwork that you have to fill out, just not as extensive that way. Like you have to make sure you're listed as somebody that can be a HIPAA contact and can actually share that information, um, not just assume that if you're a daughter or brother or sibling or some way related that you could just call the doctor's office and have a conversation. Yeah, they're always asking if they can leave a message with detailed information on your voicemail. It's like, yes, it's my cell phone. I'm the only one that listens to it. It's fine. Yes, my husband can listen to it. It's fine. It's like, I guess I yeah. should make sure that he's listed as my. There's, yeah. I'll have to see. I'm always learning. See, now you got to double check. So I recently was helping my dad just go through some things and he wasn't feeling well. And he's like, can you just call the insurance? I'm like, well, you have to call the insurance and then pass the phone to me because I wasn't listed as a HIPAA contact. So as we went through the providers, he's like, at this point, I don't care. So at least you can, if like I had to call and ask the doctor a question, I was listed, but it, it's, you have to like go sign paperwork and yeah, you might not think about, right. Usually it's your, I automatically put my spouse, but people may not, right. You may not think to even do it. Cause you're like, I don't feel like filling this out later. And then <laughs> I, th- I yeah. think I think he is. But yeah, I'm going to double check just because, you know, who knows what could happen? I mean, literally five and a half years ago, I flew off my bike and crash landed onto the pavement and knocked myself out. And thankfully, I was with my friends. They used my phone to call my husband. Obviously, I'm still here and kicking. My brain is fine. I cracked my bike helmet all the way through. So there's a quick advocate for wearing bike helmet. Drives me insane. When I see families riding bikes and the kids all have helmets and the parents don't, it just makes me want to smack them and say, what, their brains are more important than yours? Like, what's wrong with you? Like, I know, it gives you ugly hair. It's nasty. They're not cute. You know, it's I always like, wear a bike helmet. These... Oh. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't wear my bike. I don't ride my bike if I have just washed my hair because I'm not going to do it every day. <laughs> too much work but you know that leaves me every other day to ride a bike so it's fine you know it's just these are choices we have to make but there was one day I actually jumped on my bike went down the hill which is quite steep to my nail appointment and I got to the bottom of the hill and I was like something feels off oh crap I don't have my bike helmet on (laughs) and I'm like it's gonna take me forever to climb this hill to get back to the house to get my bike helmet and then turn around and go, I'm going to have to like jump in the car and then get to the nail appointment. I'm already like a third of the way there. I'm just going to ride to the nail place. And I, I rode and she commented, she goes, you don't have your helmet. And I'm like, I know I'm stupid. I'm like, I'm going to have really cute nails. And I probably have busted up head. <laughs> so, oh, gosh. <laughs> so it was, it was my way of basically saying, I realized that this was a really stupid choice, but it was a choice I made at the time it was not smart. But yes, please protect your brains. They're the only ones you have, and they don't regenerate as good as other things. So you have a list of questions to ask your child's doctor 
when you go on every appointment, you said. This is on your website. Do you have a similar list for those of us caring for an older adult? Now that we've made sure that we're HIPAA compliant, they can talk to us? <laughs> yes, <laughs> making sure that they can talk to us. As I mentioned earlier in my introduction, even though I spin it for pediatrics, a lot of the questions would be the same if you're adult asking for yourself or if you're asking on behalf of someone else. So any of those questions that's going to help you basically my basically get more information to help you make an informed decision. So asking if they're making a recommendation, asking for more information on that and not feeling silly about it, right? I think often sometimes when we don't advocate well for ourselves, it's because that if we do you understand what's going on or we don't understand what's going on? We feel silly that we don't understand what's going on. So then we're like, I'm not going to feel that. I'm going to go Google it instead, instead of asking the person in front of me who can help me answer the question that hopefully is has a trusting relationship. So yes, yeah, so a lot of the questions I would always tell people kind of to ask the doctor is like, great. If it's a medication, is that the only medication that's out there? Is that the treatment plan? Um, I like to say to stay away from cost questions, but if it, like, how can you handle the situation if you can't afford it? So don't have to necessarily go down the rabbit hole of the provider has to know how much everything costs. Cause right. We're talking about healthcare system where you get 15 minutes. So using that 15 minutes super wisely, but how can you get back in contact if this isn't working? Like, what should you do if this isn't working? What if it's like, what's the best method? Should you just make a follow-up appointment in a week just in case? So it's kind of some of those questions, but yeah, I think any, any question that can help you make an informed decision is going to help you advocate better for yourself. Makes sense. I learned, oh boy, this is, this is like, mid 90s mid to late 90s my doctor prescribed a z-pack for me i think i don't know it was the most expensive antibiotic on the planet my daughter was like preschool age so like i said she's about 30 now so we're talking about ancient history and i remember at the grocery store at the pharmacy i'd pulled out my checkbook back in those days when we did those things <laughs> and and they said so we're talking i think this was like 96 and she told me the, the medication was $125. That almost sounds cheap compared to <laughs> yeah, it's nowadays. nowadays. But it was, we're talking an antibiotic. You know, like antibiotics right. are generally pretty cheap. Now, I am allergic to penicillin, so they do have to find alternatives. But I don't know, there's like, what, hundreds of alternatives to penicillin? And I remember putting my checkbook back in my wallet and getting on a credit card because that was a lot of money. I mean, that was yeah. just like, holy Toledo. And so when I went back to the doctor the next time, I basically told him, I'm like, dude, you can't prescribe me the designer drugs. I like, I need the generic cheap crap because I don't have prescription coverage as part of my healthcare package. It wasn't, it wasn't an option. And the, he had no clue what costs were. And I don't, I don't say that as a criticism for him because he was a really good doctor. It's just, that's the way the system is. No clue. So I did, you know, and that's when he told me, he's like, I have no idea what places charge. He said, you maybe you should have gone someplace else. I'm like, I was at the store. I didn't feel good. I had a toddler like, dude, like, I'm not going to shop around for, for an antibiotic. Right. And the pharmacist had already filled it. And I didn't think you could tell them, oh, yeah, no, thank you. I'll skip it because then I don't know what you do with it once you've filled it. So as um, long as it doesn't leave the pharmacy, you can tell them you don't want it. No. OK, well, that's <laughs> helpful to know, but not necessarily the best choice. And yeah. So he did write on my chart generic drugs if possible. So we didn't really have that problem going forward. Thankfully, I'm also very rarely ill. So, you know, it it worked out, but it was. I mean, I was young enough, probably still naive enough to go. What do you mean you don't know the cost of this stuff? You prescribed it. And so I don't know if other people aren't aware of that, but that is generally the case. They don't have a clue. And it, I think because I'm with an all-inclusive system, I know Kaiser is not back east where you guys are, I don't think. No, yeah, she's not. Yeah, okay. I was pretty sure of that, but I can't keep track of my own stuff half the time. <laughs> um, they will tell you, like, I have been dealing with shingles for almost, well, for over two months now. and it, I would, I, when I was not feeling great, you know, and you have to sit there and wait for them to fill your prescription, socially distanced, wearing masks in this hallway. It's just like, bleh, I don't really want to deal with this. Can you just call it into the local drugstore that's literally a mile from my house? And the doctor said, yes, I can. 
but it will cost X, whereas if you do it through us, it'll cost less than X. And I'm like, fine. It's not that big a dollar difference, but I'm super frugal, so I dealt with it. <laughs> and yeah. my, hus- my husband's on blood thinners, and he just has them mailed to us. Mostly because it's one of those situations where, oh, I need to get my, I need to refill my, my blood thinners. Oh, I need to, better, better do that. Getting close. Oh, I need to refill. Ah, oh, crap. Now I got to rush over there. And now I got to, now it's like a must do this minute kind of thing. So I took him a little while because it's, their payment system is different than the hell. It's like the whole system is such a mess. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're unraveling a lot here going down this. <laughs> And I yeah. could talk about that side of it forever. That's uh, true. Yeah. Um, it's but just, it, it's once you, I mean, sometimes you just have to like suck it up and just navigate through it and realize that hopefully some of this stuff is only going to happen once. And I, I told him, I'm like, you should just have, I'm like, we're not that far. We're like, eh, 12 minute drive from the hospital, pharmacy, medical center. But it's one of those things like, you know, the day that you're like about to run out is the day that you don't have time to go over there and deal with that. So I'm like, just have them mail it to us. That way you don't ever have to worry about it. And that took him like they wouldn't. He had an issue with the credit card. It's like, I give you a credit card to pay for my premium. Why don't why why is this different? (laughs) It was just a joke. It was like, you know, you just kind of like sit there and go, why is this so hard? Yeah, it's why, super hard. Yeah, that's why I wanted to talk to you because, you know, I, I'm i sure most people who are online like you and I are see people from other countries who are just like, what is wrong with your system down there? Like, we don't get it. Yeah, yeah. Medications definitely, since we're talking about them for a minute, are hard. And if you're not in an inclusive healthcare system, it's even worse. So the reason the providers don't know the price is because... The insurance company gets to contract or make the decision of what they'll pay for or not pay for and change it anytime they feel like it. <laughs> so one minute your medication's covered and the next minute it's not. Uh, so yeah, it's hard to prefer providers to keep up on that. Would we love it? Would we love their system to tell us that? And do we think our systems that are electronic tell us way more information than they do? Yes, but they don't. <laughs> so it is, yeah, frustrating and it it's it's hard to be a patient because of all that information, uh, and it, it you do have to really advocate for yourself and others and participate. Otherwise, you might end up with these massive. Well, you probably could still end up with massive bills. So I don't want to say you won't end up with them, but you do have to ask those questions. If it is too expensive, at least know that you could call the provider and say ask them if there's a cheaper option. Um, like you have that option. You mean don't cry at the grocery store pharmacy because the bill is $125? Well, you could still do that, too. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that wasn't very effective. <laughs> it didn't fix the situation, but it, that's what I wanted to do. It was just... It's and sometimes a- you can ask at the pharmacy. Like sometimes the pharmacists do know. It, it's this unfortunate system that sometimes the actually insurance company will spit back something that says like, this would be a cheaper option. And sometimes the computer system doesn't. So you could still ask the pharmacist if they know. And if it is an insurance they see all the time, they might actually like be used to what's covered and not covered. So that you could, while you're there, probably ask the pharmacist first. But once again, it's not a guaranteed. They might just say like, oh, I don't know. you got to call your insurance company, um, which you could do too, actually, is call the insurance company if you wanted to try to navigate it yourself. Otherwise, what ends up happening is you call the provider, they send something else over that might still be expensive, and you just keep going through that circle until you find something that works. This was kind of, I think this was back in the pre electronic days, or it was in the early electronic days at best, because like I said, it was in the mid 90s. Yeah, so you had the paper, yeah, script. So it wasn't as it was easy to go back to the doctor, get the prescription, go back to the pharmacy. Um, but now, if I don't know across the whole country. I'm in New York State. We have mandatory electronic prescribing. Uh, so if you do, have, I don't know. I think if we do too. Does I mean we're the most populous state in the union. I think I think we do stuff first most of the time. But thankfully, I haven't had to deal with prescriptions much. Even with my mom, you know, mostly her prescriptions were filled through an online pharmacy through the care home. So I didn't have to deal with those at all. I had oh, to right. like remember to ask the, the care staff, like, can you please print out the medication? She's like, because I never remembered. Whenever we'd go to the doctor, that was like my biggest like challenge beyond getting her and dealing with the doctors, like remembering to ask. I'm like, I never understood why they would ask me what medication she's on. I'm like, whatever you put her on. 
<laughs> that was always my my desired oh, response. Yeah. But, you know, I, I got good at call, letting them know, mom has a doctor's appointment on X date. I'll pick her up at this time. Can you please remember to help or help me remember to to print out the medication list to take to the doctor in case they ask? And they were always great with it. Once I got into that habit, it was super easy. But, you know, not dealing with prescriptions most of my life, you know, just the occasional, you know, whatever you need for bronchitis or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm rarely sick. So it's that of, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to keep it that way. This whole shingles thing is killing me. It's, you know, after a year plus with, co- you know, with all this COVID going on and I've worked from home for 16 years. There was nothing to do, so I was not going anywhere. And they are just starting to open stuff up, and I get sick. And it where the shingles affected me, it felt like it hurt to breathe, but it didn't. It was weird. And it was hard to describe, and I'm pretty descriptive, but the doctor insisted I take a COVID test, and I said, I will do that, just in case, because this Delta variant thing is, like, going crazy. I said, but I'm going to tell you now, if I've got COVID, this town's getting nuked because I don't go anywhere. I'm vaccinated and I don't go anywhere. So like, I don't know how I would get COVID if if that's the case. And I was like beyond 100 percent convinced that it was impossible. So I'm like, well, I know how the universe works with me, so I better double. I better just do it. And it was negative. And that delayed getting the shingles vaccine not vaccine, which is coming. It's They've ordered it for me. I'm still waiting for my system to clear up so I could take it. It took a while to get the diagnosis, which has just been lovely. So I'm mad that my body attacked itself. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Like, dang yeah. it, could I, have, could I have gotten something from somebody in the grocery store or something? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's like the weirdest thing. And they were really good when I said, well, you know, I'd like to discuss the shingles vaccine with you later this year and next thing i know i got a message from the healthcare system that it had been ordered and i'm like and it said specifically to take it when it was all cleared up and it's still not all cleared up so it's like okay i guess i'm gonna postpone <sighs> that pro- appointment but that leads me into learning how to advocate for yourself and your loved one which is the whole point of this conversation although we keep going around in a circle <laughs> around that which is very typical of me i have learned and i don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing not to, you know, like, I'm sure, and I don't know how much you deal directly with patients, but I can only imagine what dealing with people who don't feel good, who are whining and belly aching must be like. By the end of the day, I am sure there are people you guys would like to punch. <laughs> <laughs> I won't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> she is taking the fifth. Got it. <laughs> so I remember once, I don't remember what it was. I had some seasonal something or other that it was yucky. It was nasty. I mean, it was, this was pre COVID. This was many years ago. It was so bad. When you went to the doctor's office, they were like, you're coughing, put this mask on. I've never been to the doctor and had them do that. You know, I'm in the old days when my daughter was little, they'd be like, oh, your child is sick. Go wait in the car, which I always hated. I always thought the healthy kids should wait in the car, but mostly because the car was not, it was either hot or cold. It was never like comfortable. But nobody asked my opinion, so we just did what we were instructed. So I have had this situation where they're like, well, how are you doing today? Well, I'm okay. No, actually, I'm not. I'm at the doctor's office. <laughs> like, I don't want to whine and complain because I really don't want you guys to want to punch me because I really am a nice person. <laughs> and I have a, sometimes I feel like we're trained just in general politeness. To not complain, not to be like, oh my gosh, this shingles rash is ah, just like going on and on because I'm not sure that's even helpful. So how do we indicate that we feel horrible in a po- in, I don't even know if it's possible in like a positive, <laughs> constructive way? There we go. Yeah, I th- I think that constructive is probably that keyword there because. I don't expect people to be positive when you're having hard conversations and their kids aren't feeling well or you're not feeling well or somebody you're with isn't feeling well. Uh, But I think the being succinct and knowing kind of what's going on, like and being honest. Right. So I, for some reason, we're also trained to tell because doctors are authority figures to tell them what we think they want to hear. And I think then you're telling them what you think is going on with yourself and what you think they want to hear. And 
what medications you may or may not be taking because you don't want to lie that you weren't taking the medications because you want to get in trouble. Like, so there's kind of all that. So when they're asking, like, what is going on to try to be as factual as possible. And once again, when we think that, unfortunately, you only often have 15 minutes, try not to tell your whole story of it took me, if it was really important to the event to say, like, you fell off the ladder, then say you fell off the ladder. But you don't have to say, like, I fell off the ladder because I was doing the shingles and then I did this. And then I was went downstairs and back upstairs and I put the bucket on the wrong little rung, so that's why I fell off. Like, so if we can try to like say what's going on so that help the provider not have to filter through, right, all that information. And I don't want to say you can't tell stories and we don't want to connect with you, right? Like you have to build that trust relationship and get to know people. For sure. But kind of saying what is, what what's really going on? Like, does it hurt? Like if it hurts, say it hurts. Don't down downplay it at all. And you don't have to, I think you could be, factual and still be polite right and I think the politeness more comes with the hi how are you well I'm not okay today but thank you for asking right the thank you for asking is the polite piece <laughs> like thanks I'm here I'm not doing great um so I think we sometimes mix like right the positive and polite together and you don't necessarily have to be positive uh, but kind of asking their questions and then the other along those lines in in addition another thing that kind of popped into my mind is when we want to ask the provider about like their opinion on something that we looked ahead of time, right? Cause we all look ahead of time of like what could be going on. And I know that can cause conflict when you're like, Oh, but Google said, and I'm saying Google, I not, not other, everyone doesn't just use Google, like just there's more to Google than Google, but that's where people, that's where I think some of the frustration comes in and asking that question of, I read about this. Can you provide me like your professional opinion versus saying like, are you sure you're like, instead of asking them what they recommend and then not liking their recommendation and then saying, oh, but I read this online. So like that, it's that stuff that honestly I say gets probably the most frustrating if I'm looking at it as me as a provider. Um, so as a patient, like how do you come in with that information and and kind of don't ask them for all their opinions first and then give them all the information, you know, like tell them this is what I have going on. Um, I know you don't like it when I like you could even put throw those things in there. I know you don't like it when we look stuff up, but I did. So what is your uh, professional opinion on this? So kind of just using those wor- like preemptive words. That makes sense. Be I, I actually try not to look stuff up because I'm sure most people who have looked stuff up have experienced the oh, you have this strange rash. It could be a skin irritation or you could be dying. You know, it's like (laughs) everything leads to dying. It's like, I don't want to read that crap. Part of my struggle with getting diagnosed with the shingles is that we did everything on the phone. And so I had to send her pictures, which the placement of the rash is kind of a challenge to photograph. And it was like, I I did at one point tell her, I just came back from the medical center from the COVID test. I'm more than happy to turn around so that you can look at me and talk to me and we can just cut through the chase and make this happen. But that wasn't an option. I I did get assigned to her, which is probably frustrating for her because there were no general physicians in my area, I think I mentioned this earlier, that were taking new patients. And when I went in, like as an emergency appointment for this weird issue that I get with my ears from wearing my AirPods too often, the doctor said, oh, well, you've talked to so-and-so online. Did you like her? I'm like, well, she did a pretty good job diagnosing this ear thing, you know, on a telehealth call, which I was pretty impressed with because you can't look in somebody's ears and you do a pretty good job diagnosing. You know, I- I'm going to give you pretty good props for that one. So he assigned me or somehow I got assigned to her. And I like her on the phone. I've never met her in person. <laughs> so that's kind of a little bit frustrating. And I totally lost my train of thought, which I totally hate when that happens. <laughs> Part of it, my issue with her, <clears throat> is she doesn't have a clue about me. She doesn't have a clue about my family history with Alzheimer's because that is my biggest, I don't want to say concern. That is That would be my biggest health care worry. I don't worry about it because I do everything I can to prevent coming down with Alzheimer's or or. Having Alzheimer's, I'm not sure you come down with Alzheimer's, but I do everything possible to delay onset of it or prevent it. So she doesn't even know about the Alzheimer's in my family. She also doesn't know that I have a really high tolerance to pain. So when people say, 
what's your pain threshold like? On a scale from one to 10, it's like, do I tell them what other people probably would say or do I tell them what I think? So I find that I generally yeah. skew a little higher because if I tell them, well, it's kind of a three, they're going to be like, oh, well, here's an aspirin. You know, when right. for me, a three is bad. <laughs> you know? it's, yeah. It's, and I think building that trust is huge. And if you don't have that or right providers left or you're finding a new provider or even if you've been with a provider forever and you haven't built that relationship, I think it's OK to keep reminding them. I mean, yes, we I hate to say it this way, but we think like our provider like knows everything about us and we do have the charts and we look in, but like we're all forgettable sometimes unless you're there. If you're there, especially once a year, like even if it's in your chart from the last note that they're looking quick, they could have missed it. So if there's things that you think impact your story, like just, you know, here's what's going on with me. And I want to remind you that I have this family history in case you didn't see it. And you could, like I said, some of those softener words, like in case you didn't see it, like those are kind of the ones I like to throw in there if you're trying to be polite, <laughs> you know, and instead of just assuming they didn't see it or all. Yeah. So kind of anything that I say is, you know, impacts you that you might not think the provider always realizes. And same thing with the pain threshold would be completely I just want to tell you, my pain threshold is usually low. I think it's a three, but probably compared to somebody else that I like, I'm. it's probably a five. So how do you want to take that? So let them kind of interpret it, but kind of give them both options and see what they do with the, the information. That's a good idea. Because when I broke my collarbone and the orthopedic surgeon asked me, well, what's your pain level? I'm like, eh. I don't, I don't remember what the answer was. And he goes, really? And I was like, this is it supposed to be worse? And I was like, oh, let me revise my answer. Well, like 10 is crying and I wasn't near crying. So I'm like, okay, we're not at the 10. This is not fun. And I've never broken any other bones ever. So, you know, 49 and a half was the first broken bone. And it, and it broke in um, like a V. And I'm fairly certain the broken tip was poking the muscle. Because sometimes it would be, ooh, it was not fun. Till they fixed it with the plate, it was like there were times when it was like, I feel like there's like this this sharp jabbing stick in this muscle. It was just, it was weird and it was uncomfortable and. I'm and you probably said it was a pain it. level one. <laughs> yeah, no, but it. I guess it also goes back to like, am I dying from the pain? No. Do I want to? You know, do I want to die from this pain? No. Okay, so I just kept like dialing it back and. I kind of learned through that experience that dialing it back isn't necessarily smart, but I also learned that narcotic pain relievers are not fun. Yeah. And the other with pain, because we're talking about it too, is yes, they ask you like scale one to 10. And if you're getting a nurse or it's like a history question, you might just answer. But if you're having the conversation, as you talked about with your shingles, like if it's impacting your quality of life, like add that in there. You don't like I said, don't have a 15 minute story about it, but just saying like, I can't do my activities of daily living, like shower right now, because yes, it doesn't hurt pain. It's like a five, but if I shower, it's a 10. Yeah. So you could kind of add a little bit more context to even when they ask these kind of very, which you might want to answer just quickly, factually, because it's so pinpointed. That makes sense. That's actually, well, I'm glad I, I sent her the message about the quality of life in this issue. And it's and it's hard because it's like, I know she's super busy because she wasn't taking new patients and she got me stuck into her, her roster. And we'll see if I get a response. If I don't, I will call the advice nurse because it's like, I'm just, I'm like at the end of my, I'm done, I'm done with this issue. <laughs> but I'm also working on it on my end. Like, okay, well, if I ice it, I might just have to ice it multiple times a day. And you said use those stickers that you put on kids for fevers, which after I have lunch, definitely going to the drugstore and looking for. Because that would be a lot less obvious <laughs> under my shirt. <laughs> if, you know, and if I just lose the 30 pounds I've been trying to lose, I think it would help too because everything rubs together after a while. It's like, mm, it's just not fun. So one of the biggest challenges of caring for somebody with cognitive disease is the difficulty of getting to the doctor and then taking into consideration under these circumstances. When do you think we should get a second opinion and when should we accept the status quo? Because like, for example, 
at the very beginning of the pandemic, my mom was non-cooperative with the caregivers and she slipped and broke her leg and they didn't, they, I, I was, because she was at advanced stage of Alzheimer's and I know from talking to people like yourself and my research that anesthesia is not necessarily a good idea for older adults and for people with already a brain issue. So I was fairly certain I wasn't going to fix it, but I wanted, you know, I needed advice. And of course this was at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's like, Oh goody, I get to do all the stuff talking to people on the phone, which was interesting. I don't know if I would have gotten a second opinion in that circumstance, but had she not been in later stage Alzheimer's, I might've wanted to, I mean, the orthopedic surgeon at the hospital, she was in a different um, insurance provider than I am. And it's not as good. My, it's actually not my opinion. It's actually a fact. But he wasn't super interested in, like, you know, that we all know surgeons like to do surgery. So that's their go-to. He did not try to strong arm me into doing surgery on her. So that was my first clue that this was probably not ideal. He also said she was going to need physical therapy whether we did surgery or not. So I called in a, a traveling physical therapist who she practically slapped out of her room. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not paying you another 150 bucks to go be abused by her again, not to have any success. So it she sort of helped make the decision. And it was definitely the right decision because as most of us know, when an older person falls, even if they don't have Alzheimer's and are you know, super healthy, Sometimes that bone that breaks is the last straw and their bodies just give up. And that's what happened with my mom. She, she fell on March 8th and she died on March 31st. So I'm really glad we didn't put her through any more trauma than necessary. But there was also other medical issues with her that I declined to deal with because of her Alzheimer's. But had we gone back five years, I might have had a different opinion. But getting her to and from the doctor was ay ay ay. That was more stress than anybody needed to deal with her, me, the doctor. So under like your personal opinion, when do you think is important to get second opinions? So putting the it's difficult to get to the doctor aside piece because there are barriers to getting second opinion. So I and cost. And so assuming in an ideal world where none of that was a concern, I think it Usually a significant diagnosis, I almost always get to say, try to get a second opinion. So in my case, that was looking at cancer and not that I wouldn't believe they were cancer, but part of the part of the second opinion is treatment options as well, not just solidifying the diagnosis. So I actually had my second opinion before my first opinion because like because I knew I wanted a second opinion. And so as soon as I got I made two opinions back, to they happened to be back to back uh, and there's nothing wrong with waiting for that first opinion to get your second opinion. Like if you are going through something that you know is probably going to be a long course or something severe, I always say, if you can get the second opinions, because it's not just diagnosis, it's treatment as well. And then the other kind of red flags to get second opinions would be if like you, something doesn't sound or feel right to you. Like if something just feels off with what you're told, get the second opinion. And it could be, maybe it's your primary care that you trust, but you're just ask them if there's a specialist, right? Like that's a second opinion. It doesn't always have to be specialists. And then also, as you mentioned earlier with the physical therapy, sometimes maybe you need a physical therapist opinion if it's like a mobility issue. And sometimes your second opinions might not necessarily be another provider. So usually we say second opinion, we think to expert opinions of a doctor. Uh, But I think anytime something just doesn't feel right, you should, if you can, you should get that second opinion. And then the other kind of way around it, because is if you can't access another provider. So the hard parts are like if you're in a hospital, but you still might be able to ask, like they're not going to get another just physician off the floor, but you might be able to still ask, is there a specialist? Um, In that case, is there a hospice? Is there somebody else who could get another uh, opinion? And also, once again, we were talking about earlier about like, how do you word it? Like you don't want to offend the doctor and be like, I don't trust you. Can I just have a second opinion? Uh, You could just say, like, I really appreciate what's going on, but, like, is there somebody who specializes in this area to provide me more information, too, um, and kind of spin it that way? And I will say most doctors, if they're great doctors, 
actually encourage second opinions themselves. It's a kind of a backup for them. I mean, like yeah. none of this is medicine's not black and white as much as we might like it to be. Um, and we have lots of knowledge about lots of diseases. And But, you know, COVID has given us a very good education on we learn more and more as every day goes by. What we learned, what we knew March of 2020 was different in March of 2021. And yes, that's frustrating. And I am fully vaccinated and I don't like the fact that, you know, I have to wear a mask to go to the store. That was one of the reasons to get vaxxed was to, you know, kind of mm -hmm. resume normal life. But you know what? I've had shingles, which means my immune system is not 100 percent. So thankfully, I will wear a mask because I care about myself and everybody else. You know, it's not that they lied to us or they, you know, whatever. It's like, you know, we learn new things and our opinions change. Why is that a bad thing? So yeah. that's how I would approach asking for a second opinion. And for myself personally, I like, I like to know the why. I mean, I need to know details. Mm -hmm. Like if I can't have a second round of antiviral, why? Explain it to me. Oh, yeah. that's why. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. I will not harass you anymore about that. You know, it's yeah. just, it's like, you want to get me off your back? Answer the why question, which is why I'm terrible at math. There's no and sometimes why. sometimes two providers know that we get passed around a lot as patients. And once again, like, it's all sometimes in our own heads. But if they're continually told, like, oh, stop passing me around, then they might not give you a second opinion, not because they don't want to, because they might have just had 10 patients in a row that were, like, annoyed that they offered up a second opinion. So I think always... Right. Your day plays into your day and healthcare providers are still people and they still like used to get kind of see patterns and don't do stuff or do stuff depending on their timing. So I don't think it's ever bad to or ask those whys. And if they say, oh, I'm not sure, be like, oh, do you know anybody who like might I know you're limited in your time. Like, do you know anybody who I could get a second opinion with? And uh, or do you have somebody that you could not work to that could answer the why? And then you can get back to me, too, if you that's always we actually do a lot of behind the scenes talking like you'd be surprised in an office if there's more than one provider they might actually be talking to another provider it makes sense and i really appreciate that you are giving people ways of asking the tougher questions and wording things so that we are not the patients that you want to punch at the end of the day <laughs> i don't want to see in the chart this person's a pain in the <laughs> Yeah. Like, and I think it's hard on both ends. Cause like you said, you don't feel well. And some patients are like, well, I shouldn't be the one that has to be ni like nice. I don't feel well. And I think, right. Providers, we know we went and they're going to get sick patients and people that are crabby and you'd probably be crabby if you're in the same situation. So we need to fix both ends. So I also don't want it to sound, <laughs> I hope it's not sounding like, Hey patient, you have to be perfect because I think providers need to also be just as great as kind of opening up conversations. But no, I'm not getting the sense that we we need to take more effort. It's, I think, for myself, and I hope the listeners are feeling the same thing, is it's like, how do you ask these questions? Or how do you say, you know, wow, I'm really confused on this. Is there somebody that can help clear things up for me? Or can you ask somebody else and get back to me? Like, the things that you've suggested are just, I swear, I'm going to have to, like, make a transcript of just the talking points for the provider, because I think they've been really great. And, you know, I don't, it's hard because you want to be polite and you want to be a, you know, a, a responsible, respectful person, but you feel like crap and you're confused. And, you know, in your case, you had cancer. And in my case, I was dealing with a mom who had Alzheimer's and had no clue what was going on. Why is she here? Why are we doing this to her? It was just like, you know, it was just easier to just like, you just want to put your hands over your face and go, no, 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 it's not happening. I'm not dealing with it, <laughs> which obviously is not, not ideal. So I have one last question. Obviously, COVID has exploded the options of telehealth. They just did recently learn some barriers to that. That You know, like if my doctor is not licensed in New York, which I would assume she is not, she wouldn't be able to like help you. If, if for whatever reason you had somehow connected with her. I personally love telehealth appointments because I really don't like to have to go sit in the waiting room and all that nonsense. I hate all that crap. But I realize I have a geriatrician that talks regularly on the podcast and she is a huge advocate for basically, and I apologize if anybody's like a little, a little shy. She wants to like strip you down to your briefs and she wants to see your whole body. Because she's had cases where things have been missed 
because they basically don't undress their patients enough, which that sounds really kinky. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'd have to read her. She's huge on Instagram. It's Dr. Elena Mucci. You guys can find her if you go to my links on Instagram. You also know she's been on the show a lot. When, in your opinion, should we say, I have to suck it up and actually just go to the doctor's office? And when is it maybe okay to just say, the next available appointment I could get is actually a telehealth one, even though I have no idea how they're going to diagnose this weird stuff going on with my ears? If she, I don't know. Am I going to put my ear up against the, the webcam? I don't know what's going to go on there. And that's what my situation was this past March. It was like, it was a Friday. It was in between Zoom calls with senators. And it was like, I, I either have to do a telehealth call or wait. And it was super annoying. It was, they were really itchy. And it was just like, I'm over this. So when do you think we should suck it up? And when do you think a telehealth appointment might be sufficient? I love telehealth too. And I think that it is expanding just the way we practice medicine and access is a huge barrier. Like, especially with COVID times, like you can't even get, as you mentioned, into the doctor. And I think that if you aren't feeling well, any appointment you can get, get, because then if the doctor sees you and they're like, I need to see you in person behind the scenes, they might find an appointment for you that wasn't available before, right? So if you're just making an appointment and you're talking to the scheduler, they don't know what's urgent, what's not urgent. So I think any appointment you can get, most insurances don't and it, like restrict like you that you'd have to wait a week to see another appointment. Like there are lots of insurance barriers and lots of rules. So don't quote me on if your insurance <laughs> tries to charge you twice now, like you'd have to probably pay your copay. But so I would say get the appointment now that telehealth is available. If that's the appointment you can get, even if it's a rash, that's, that's what the healthcare system did. And if the doctors keep seeing people that show up with telehealth on rashes, then they need to make sure that there's more appointments available for rashes that they want to see in person. So obviously once again, if, if you don't have the financial, gain, if it's like a $500 copay just to see the doctor, that might not be the most feasible option. And if it is something physical, then you might maybe want to wait the extra couple of weeks, but, or call the office, like call the a, a triage nurse or advice nurse, or they all have different names depending on the office instead of just calling the schedule or maybe ask the nurse for advice too, because sometimes they can get you in. But if the only way to see somebody is the telehealth I say go for the telehealth, and then if the provider needs to see you in person, then that's kind of their their responsibility to help get you there in person. So you think it's their decision that we should rely on to to be in person versus whatever's available? Yes, honestly, okay. yes, yeah. In terms, of, obviously, they, if they've never seen you before, then <laughs> for that that's been issue. My case. <laughs> Yeah, like if they've never seen you before that for that issue, I mean, what else are you going to do? Like you said, you're not going to wait three months for something that's bothering you. Now, if you have appointments back to back, like say they have an appointment at 8.15 at telehealth and 8.15 in person, like same date, same name and time. And you're like, ah, I don't feel like going to the doctor, but they probably need to look in my ear. I think we all know, like you should probably, if you can fit in the appointment, fit in the in-person appointment. Um, but if it's more of a, I'm not going to be able to see the doctor or talk to anybody for three months, get in there and see the provider and then they can try to push things along if it's important, if that makes sense. Like, it I don't want to say always choose telehealth if they're, but if it's an, I need to see the doctor. I agree that I think the, um, who you were just mentioning, like, yes, oftentimes there's physical symptoms. They might not, you might not realize you have that. If you can't see your back and you live by yourself. The doctor yeah, might be like, true. oh, did you not realize that rash all over you? Yeah, it's, like, it's like, holy moly. Well, that was how I was, how I was diagnosed with shingles was after I talked to the doctor on the phone. Let's say I talked to her via messaging, you know, the in-health messaging system. And then she said, I think you need to, a COVID test, which was like, are you kidding me? But I did it because... Mostly, it was it was mostly like I am a hundred percent certain this is not the problem, but I'm not a doctor, and I would really hate to be like asymptomatic or almost asymptomatic and like spread it all over the place. My daughter's right. immunocompromised, and I'm like, 
whatever. You know, I've been through so many things in the past few years. What the hell? COVID tests just add to the experience list. <laughs> so it was not that big a deal. You know, do I want to do them again? Not really. Didn't hurt. Not, not a problem. And then as I was coming home, she called me, which was good because I technically had an appointment with her. But it was a phone call appointment, but it said it was in person and I was really super confused. So I would have ended up back at the medical center like two hours later. But then I talked to her in the car as I was driving home from the medical center. And then she she asked me if I had a rash and I had I said, hang on a second. I got to pull into the garage because I can't look at myself while I'm driving. <laughs> and she's like, That's oh, good. you could, you could call me back. And I said, no, hang on a second. I'm like, two houses, one house. Okay, wait, now I'm in the garage. I'm like, now the Wi-Fi will pick up the phone call. Okay, we're good. Okay, now I can turn off the car. It was like this weird, you know, it was like less than a minute that she had to like wait for the technology to allow me to examine my own self. But then she had me send more photographs via the messaging app. I woke up on Friday morning, it was, so it was the, right before the 4th of July. I, can't, I think the 4th of July was the Saturday or Sunday. And she said, you don't, ha- or my COVID test came back negative Thursday night. And she messaged me, your COVID test came back negative. I think you have shingles. I hadn't even gotten out of bed. I looked up shingles. I'm like, yep, that looks pretty, uh, pretty, pretty similar. And then she never responded to the, my response to her message. So the next morning, the Saturday, I called the advice nurse. And when, and they patched me through to like the emer, emergency doctors, not the on-call doctors. On-call. They, yeah. And she's, and I, they said, if you have, I said, the rash is getting worse. And they're like, can you send more pictures? I'm like, yes, I can. So I'm literally using my cell phone, taking the picture <laughs> and the phone rings and it's the doctor. I'm like, oh, I was just sending more pictures. She's like, I don't need to see them. You've got shingles. And I'm like, are you sure? She's, I said, I've already taken the picture. She's like, well, you could send it. So I did. And I uploaded it. She's like, yep, nope, that's shingles. I'm like, this is the weirdest Thing. Like nobody's ever like touched me, looked at me. I was appreciative that I didn't have to leave because I didn't feel good, but it was just the weirdest, you know, having not had telehealth ever in my life mm-hmm. until this year was just the it was very unusual. And I really, really wish we could have done it with my mom. So I'm hoping that there's I'm hoping going forward that there are more options for like an in-home urine test, like collection, not this the test, because My mom likely had an ovarian tumor, but the gynecological oncologist, that is a real big mouthful. I, they wanted me to come into the office to talk to them. I'm like, no, you can talk to me on the phone. My mom there has insurance God can't get. So you can like bill her insurance. I don't care, but I'm not driving to your office to talk to you about this. So I never got it diagnosed, but she would end up with blood in her urine often enough that the care staff would freak out and I would rush her over to the doctor and collecting a urine sample from a woman who doesn't understand what's going on. Not fun. And I always had to remind the doctor's office. This is my huge frustration with doctor's office. It's like, no, she can't pee in a cup. Last time we were here, you did the little hat thingy in the toilet. Why do I have to remind you people of this? Why is this not in her chart? Like, why is there not a big red sticker on the front of her chart that says advanced Alzheimer's? Like, I swear they forgot she had Alzheimer's. Every time we were there made me insane. So I would have loved to have been able to go collect urine and take it to the doctor's office. Or, I mean, I just did a colorectal test, you know, that they mail you in the, in, I feel very bad for the mailman. (laughs) What you're sending back is not fun, but you know, it's like so much easier, you know, when they need specific bodily fluids to collect them when it's convenient and not have to try to do it. Under pressure, <laughs> right term. I'm trying to keep this not gross in case people are eating. <laughs> but I would have loved it. Like they barely needed to see her; they just basically needed to test her ears. I'm really hoping we move forward with more at home collection of samples. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think as patients, we are going to start requesting that more, and there's usefulness to it. And like you said, even the telehealth. My, I did a lot of my cancer care an hour and a half away, and some of it um, here and where I'm from. But so yeah, that, now that I can do telehealth for some of my follow up appointments with my surgeon, my oncology oncologist is here, so I like to see him in person. But for the surgeon who's just kind of doing a quick check, I'm like, well, I just saw my oncologist; he just did a physical exam. Like, this is nice. I could just do a telehealth check in and not drive the hour and a half and take a half day off of work. And um, so I think as we start 
seeing the benefits on on both sides. I th- and even with the home collection stuff, I think people are going to start realizing how it's helpful. And it's going to take time, though, right? It takes, what, seven years for things to change, like culture shifts to change. So it's not going to happen overnight. But I think it's, if anything good about the pandemic came through, I think it, the, the telehealth is a huge one. I appreciate that the, to the, the pandemic did uh, drop kick uh, expedience on some changes. Because, you know, at 55, thereabouts, you know, I would prefer to live the next 45 years of my life, 50 years of my life. Uh, with some of these newer changes that I hope are coming, I, I, in my more negative moments, it's like, you know, none of, none of this stuff's going to change fast enough for my husband and I. I see it coming, but I don't see it coming fast enough, and it's frustrating, but... You never know. I guess maybe we should advocate for, hey, and I do remember asking once if I could collect mom's urine, and I forgot why they told me no, which they probably wouldn't tell me no now. She was such a pain in the butt to deal with. It would have been but it would have been better for everybody involved if they had just said, okay, here's what you need to do to make sure that it's a clean, you know, specimen, and, and you, you know, you're going to have to collect it and rush it over here, <laughs> which was yeah. fine. Yeah, and the other, too, it just... And an advocacy tip for things like that, as you were saying, how frustrating it is. Like when you're on the phone, you could remind them every time. Like once again, you think they they might even have that in the chart, a big red flag. And it's great. We get it's called uh, like alert fatigue and people are just like, OK, 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 OK. And like don't necessarily always read all the alerts. So on the phone, like remind them. And then the other if it was like frustrating and the whole office was like, this is frustrating. Ask the provider to put in like a note to say, like, no, this person can do it at home. And then when you call and they're like, no, you have to come in. But be like, can you look at the note from August 30th that said the doctor said approved? Like, I don't have to come in for this. Like, can like, why? do I all of a sudden like and have them kind of write out the steps they're supposed to tell you or like kind of so you can kind of ask some of those doesn't always work they might say no but like if you have like if you can get them to document and ask like know the date though that it's documented in the chart or around the time frame because it's a pain in the butt to look through charts honestly it's like an unorganized um like drive <laughs> like if you have all your documents unorganized and they're on 18 15 different folders like Patient charts actually aren't very neatly organized on our end. I think that actually is beneficial to know because you'd think that they would be because you'd think they'd have to be. But it's hard to organize stuff because you never know where something really like today it fits well in this folder, but tomorrow it might fit better in that folder. And you never it's like I'm yeah. a super organized person. And every so often back quarterly, I go through my Dropbox folders and it's like I haven't opened that one for a while. And it. And I move them around, and it, and then I can't find stuff because I moved them around. Exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so crazy. the easiest way to search for stuff, at least in the computer system I use at work, is by by date. Like, you can find it. But we don't have one electronic system or one health network. So if I have two different doctors, right, run two different platforms. So one's <laughs> – so we can – I know we're wrapping up, so I'll go too far into that. But I think it's, a, it's helpful to know at least that – like if you can figure out, kind of try to keep track of your own records a little bit and in terms of knowing that they could, you, it's easy to get frustrated and be like, oh, it's in my record. But if you know that it's a comes up consistently, just remind them where it is in your record. So then you can be like, remember like the MRI that I did that like three months ago. Can you, it should be the state if you want to try to look in your chart just to try to help each other out. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it does take two to get it all handled. And I do have, and I, without my notes in front of me, I don't know if it's before or after this one, an episode with a gal that is dealing with, well, she, sometimes we think our, our, our situation is difficult. She has a, a severely autistic child and she had a grandparent, I think it was with Alzheimer's. So, you know, woof. I don't even want to think about that scenario, but she created basically these different binders to help navigate the educational system, which obviously with Alzheimer's we don't need to do, but also the medical profession and keeping track of things. So you can, you can, there are items to purchase and apps and all kinds of stuff to help keep you keep track of your own information, which I personally think is a smart thing to do just for safekeeping because lord knows what could happen you know yeah (laughs) like currently new orleans has no power and you know if you need your medical records you might be or a doctor closes like if a doctor's office closes down they should pass those records on but 
actually like federal law doesn't say they have to keep your medical records for life. So like they could disappear if they were more than certain years old. I don't know all the time frames off the top of my head. Same thing with medication lists. Like the pharmacies only have to keep them for so many years. So if you're like, oh, my kid had an allergy and 10 years ago, can you look up what med they were on? No, likely not. It's probably gone. Yeah. It's like <laughs> five so, yeah. years ago might be gone too. Yeah, no, it's crazy. Well, this has been super fantastic. I so greatly appreciate all of the advice on how to talk to the providers because I think some of us get angry and don't talk nicely, and other of us try to be very polite and not a problem child and talk to, you know, we downplay what's going on. So I think yeah. you provided some really super terrific information. And I'm glad that you are three years cancer free. Thank you. That's terrific. And this has been fantastic. Now I'm going to go yeah. look at my email and see if my doctor responded to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yes, hopefully they did. Now, it's probably too early still in the day because it's just now noon. Pretty sure she hasn't responded, but well, look, you never know. It's been terrific. So if um, anybody has any questions, I've linked Stacy's website in the show notes you can check out what she's doing she does mostly photo photograph Ugh, focus on <laughs> apparently i have something on the mind there she does primarily focus on children but i bet you she could probably help with some some other questions if you really were nice to her so <laughs> thank you so much for this thank you fading memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts